I'm Dave Breckenridge, and this is Under the Dome. The seven candidates looking to replace Jason Kenney as UCP leader and premier took to the stage in Medicine Hat on Wednesday night for the first of two official party debates. The frontrunner Danielle Smith took a lot of heat for her position on Alberta sovereignty, as well as her comments recently about cancer care in the province. Meanwhile, candidates Rajan Sani, Rebecca Schultz, Travis Taves, Brian Jean, and Todd Lowen tried to get their points across in front of party faithful. So how did it all break out? That's today on Under the Dome. My guest today, Edmonton Journal Legislature reporter Ashley Joanno and Calgary Herald columnist Don Braid. Thanks very much for joining me. Um, I want to dive right into it because there is a lot to cover. And so Wednesday night was the first debate, a first official debate of the UCP leadership race, the first campaign event for the party since they closed... Uh, nominations and we and we have the finalized list of candidates Ashley we'll start with you kind of set the stage for us heading into Wednesday night's debate who is actually in the race now and what were you anticipating heading into uh, the medicine hat hangar not you weren't in the hangar but the debate was held uh, for those who didn't watch in a hangar in medicine hat in front of a giant helicopter um <laughs> reminded me of the tv show airwolf from the 80s. Anyway, a uh, <laughs> little non sequitur there. Uh, so yeah, set the stage for us heading into Wednesday night's debate. So the deadline uh, for uh, candidates to submit their required paperwork and the first chunk of their entrance fee was last week. Um, after that deadline passed, we had seven candidates who had met that sort of that first hurdle to appear on the battle or <laughs> to appear on the ballot. Uh, and we have a number of former ministers in former finance minister Travis Taves, former children's services minister Rebecca Schultz, former transportation minister Rajan Sani, uh, and um, uh, former uh, culture minister Leila Ahir, as well as former Wild Rose leaders Brian Jean and Daniel Smith, and independent MLA Todd Lowen as well. So that gets us to the seven. Mm -hmm. And and Don, from your perspective, what were you anticipating heading into Wednesday night's debate? What were you watching for? What were your thoughts on on how things could go? Well, I thought it could sort of fall apart, um, <laughs> and in a way, it did. Technically, they lost a lot of uh, contact with the Telus line and everything, and so there's lots of breakouts. So that's just for people who were who were watching. Um, I thought it, it went fairly smoothly, and I, I thought it was interesting to see just how much flack Danielle Smith took, because that's an indication of how well the other ones think she's doing. And she actually took a lot. She was a subject of a lot of the discourse all the way through, every, anywhere from her comments recent on, on cancer and cancer care uh, to, of course, the sovereignty thing. And, and uh, you know, some people like Reza and Sani were very direct. They basically said it's just a lot of nonsense and very dangerous to the province. Uh, and that was all expected. Um, it's unclear, you know, it's going to be unclear until the 6th of, of October how, how well actually she's doing. But they certainly think she's the one they have to beat. And the kind of crazy thing about all that is they're all pretty darn tough on Ottawa. If any one of them were in there, you're not going to hear any sort of hosannas for Justin Trudeau, that's for sure. And it's all just a question of degree and... Um, but she's staked that turf for herself. I have to say, it's been a very successful campaign from her point of view. Mm -hmm. Now, Ashley, for you, you know, the, the fact that um, some of these candidates were really going hard after Danielle Smith, they were going after her for her Alberta Sovereignty Act, as Don mentioned, as well as her comments recently on cancer. For people who haven't been following the debate or following the, the campaign so far, what exactly is Smith talking about with the Alberta Sovereignty Act? And, and how did the other candidates try and set themselves apart from her on, on issues that are important to Albertans, namely uh, an ongoing fight with the Trudeau government in Ottawa? Okay, so the Sovereignty Act, as Danielle Smith pitches it, is a promise to write legislation that would, she says, give Alberta the power to essentially ignore federal law and um, federal court rulings, things like that, that that Alberta decides is not in its best interest. Um, 
Critics have already said that it likely wouldn't hold up into court in court would potentially cause a constitutional crisis um, and cause just a, a bunch of uncertainty uh, for the economy and for businesses that might want to invest in Alberta if they don't know how things are gonna gonna uh, how things are gonna roll out after the mm-hmm. legislation. Um, Smith pitches it as a way of sort of getting Ottawa to stay in its lane, so to speak. She says that um, uh, Ottawa is causing chaos in Alberta by overstepping and that this legislation would be a way of sort of drawing a line in the sand, making it clear to Ottawa what Alberta's positions that, um, position is. Um, the other candidates were pretty, uh, pretty universal, I think, in their... Um, uh, distaste for the legislation as a whole. Uh, Brian Jean called it a fiscal fairy tale. Uh, at one point, Travis Taves suggested that the the idea that it could work is delusional. Uh, Sonny said that uh, went so, as far as to say that choosing someone like Smith, who who was making these risky pitches and being so hot headed would mean that they would almost certainly lose to the NDP at the next election. Um, I think uh, folks on the stage all agreed with the need to to sort of continue this this fight with Ottawa, but they believed that it could be done within the current system. Um, Jean mentioned the referendum on equalization. Taves talked repeatedly about the need to be strategic um, that kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't think, I think like Don said, no one was seeing the praises of the federal government. It's just that they mostly thought that uh, Alberta could accomplish things within the system as it exists currently. Yeah. And, and Don, from your perspective, this idea that we have a lot of these issues on which the candidates aren't that far apart in terms of, you know, whether they're, they approve of them or disapprove of them. And then it's just the the mechanics of how we go about dealing with some of these issues uh, is where they kind of stake their own territory. And with Danielle Smith kind of dominating the conversation, the debate, I, I feel like she was chosen as the debate partner for people who weren't watching, you know, candidates would get a question and then they get to choose who they wanted to be, have the primary debate with on that question. And a couple of candidates chose Danielle Smith. And so the fact that people were trying to go after Danielle Smith, does that essentially say, you know, A, that she's the front runner and B, that her ideas are the ones that are most worth worth debating? And and how do other candidates get any oxygen if that's kind of the nature of the race? Well, that's the whole thing. There's a lack of oxygen. Uh, and there are candidates like Sonny, like Schultz, like Lila here. I thought Lila was kind of inspirational last night. Actually, she's the only one who sort of presented a, a view of uh, people pulling together for, for the province. Uh, but the, but there's getting not getting very much attention. They, they, uh, but they have so many ideas that are similar. Like when it comes to things like uh, affordability, that, uh, you know, cost of living, uh, they, every one of them agrees that they've got to re-index uh, income tax uh, and other programs that are also uh, 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 de-indexed, as it were, so they don't uh, you don't get benefits from any benefit at all from inflation. Just end up paying more. And they all agree with that. When it comes to the affordability stuff, they're mostly on the same page. And these are, I think, issues that are way more important to the general public. Uh, right now than any any idea of conflict or fighting with Ottawa. You know, the chances are, are not that bad that by the time we get to an election, uh, they won't even want to fight with the federal government because there might be that Poiliev guy we know about, right? So um, uh, so it's kind of a paper tiger in a way. And her, her campaign itself is, uh, I, I think, very effective, very sharp, very quick, uh, very good at hitting, hitting the hot buttons. But how well is it really doing? You know, a couple of weeks ago, they were claiming they'd sold 7,000 memberships in 10 days, but then the party membership list came out, and they seemed to show that everybody hadn't sold as many as 6,000 in that same period. Um, but, you know, this is all about campaigning and how who's good and who isn't, and, and what you see is a sharpness in her campaign so far that sustained her very well. Will it last through October? I don't know. Will people in the party say Danielle's going to lose for us the way... 
they fiercely, as, as uh, Ashley said, fiercely went after the idea that she could lose the election with this stuff. How does the general public react? My, we don't even know what the general public thinks anymore, you guys, uh, because so many shibboleths have fallen by the wayside with the rise of Kovalev and other things. Uh, where is the middle anymore? Well, people like Danielle and, and him are pushing the mid middle as far off to the right as they can get it, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a Ashley, one, one thing I noticed last night, maybe it was, was because of the format and because you know, you got to pick who you were debating, but we didn't hear as much last night from two of the other perceived front runners, at least in some of the early polls we've seen. We have Daniel Smith ahead, and then we have Brian Jean in second, and then we have Travis Taves in third. But it seemed like it was fairly quiet from, from both of them, other than opening statements, and then the questions that they got asked directly and got to choose debate partners on for for their part what what did they have to offer at the debate and and was it just a formatting thing that that had them kind of relegated to the sidelines a little bit i mean it, that might have been part of it you did get to choose who who you wanted to debate and like we've already established a lot of people were interested in taking some swings at danielle so that by its nature left some people with less time to speak. Um, I know that Taves continues to push a, a lot on his successful balancing of the budget when he was the finance minister. Um, he did, uh, him and Todd Lowen got into it a bit near the end uh, where, and forgive me, I might not have the direct quotes, but essentially, uh, Lowen was trying to link Taves to Kenny's policies that landed the party in this situation. Uh, and uh, Taves accused Lowen, who, who Taves, who now, or sorry, Taves accused Lowen, who now sits as an independent after being kicked out of caucus, um, of like sniping from the sidelines and not, uh, and not really understanding what it's like to govern. Mm -hmm. um, the way he did. So there was a bit of that. Don, for you, was it a case of, of you know, especially for Travis Taves, if he, if polling it right now is correct and he is running third to Gene and, and Smith, he, like Rebecca Schultz and Rajan Sani and, and Leela here, had to kind of, you, you figure, had to make himself more prominent in the debate. Do you figure that Taves, you know, just by nature of how it was structured, wound up losing the debate because he had he kind of had the most to lose and the, and the most need to gain at this point. Well, first, Dave, uh, the, it was like that because they drew lots or, or lots were drawn for them. I understand there was papers that they, they were all shown that uh, papers coming out of a hat or something with their names on it. Well, Todd Lowen gets first. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian Jean gets last. He was out way, as he said, way off to the right of the stage. And then this odd, odd thing that I've never seen in debate before, which is Basically, you get to say, hey, here's what I think, and then you get to ask somebody else what they think, and then you debate with them for a while. And that left Gene, and to some degree Taves, who was number six, uh, with uh, Gene being seven, left them both out, both out, of, the, out of the flow, particularly Gene. But, you know, I don't think Gene cared that much about that or, because he had a couple of chances to get his paddle up. There was also you had a paddle you could throw it up in the air and get involved in the end of that dual debate thing and he he didn't he didn't he passed on a few opportunities to do that and by the end of the evening if anybody was still watching who was watching the live stream after all the breaks in the live stream he, he was getting to say getting getting in um taves you know there's one thing that that has never hasn't been noticed before is that taves has got this policy of throwing tariffs on other provinces um, I ended up writing a column about that because I just sort of discovered this in his policy book. So he's coming back with something that I think is just arguably is kind of striking, at least as uh, Smith's policy about auto. He's basically saying if another province or the feds do something that we don't like, we will tax uh, their goods and services. And in boom time, everybody sells a lot of stuff to Alberta, right? So it could actually hurt. But So would you end up putting tariffs on... Quebec manufacturers, 
Uh, it, it sounds right away economists jumped all over the idea. Uh, and he didn't make anything of it last night at all, but it is there in his policy. So <laughs> there's an element of weirdness starting to develop, and we don't know where it's going to go, Dave. It could go anywhere, as we've mm, learned in that, the past. That's true. And Ashley, one thing that, that I was wondering about, you know, this we're in the middle of this campaign, and, and you, you saw some some friction through the night, like Daniel Smith suggesting that the government hasn't apologized for its COVID measures and, and the, the idea that, you know, they're arguing over like who's talked more about wanting to bring in a PST. And I know Taves has talked a lot about unity within this race and, and they made it a question. I was surprised to see that the, that it was an official question in the debate. How did each of the candidates tackle this, this issue of unity when there are obviously a lot of not necessarily hurt feelings between the candidates, but hurts feelings in the conservative movement right now in the province. I don't know if I have a good answer for that one, Dave. Uh... I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure, we'll throw it on on well, that one. Yeah. You know, it was one of the most amusing things of the whole night was, first of all, they, they go ahead pounding each other, and they could have used their paddles and whacking each other. Uh, and then at the end, they were offering each other cabinet jobs, right? I think Gene was the first one to say that Taves would make a great cabinet minister, and then Daniel Smith was saying. And this is the contradiction of these kinds of things, that you're trying to beat the other people. In order to do it, you have to use the record of your own party, which people clearly aren't happy with. And then you have to somehow unite the party. And I think that one of the great open questions here is whether this party is unitable at all. It has never been united yet, except maybe on election night in 2019. And it's been falling apart ever since. So the real chore for any leader, any one of them who wins, I think I think uh, Taves could win, could well win. Gene might win. Taves is, uh, you know, I think comes across as uh, pretty solid. I think his presentation is kind of, he's kind of pushing himself out a little bit. And I see coaching in that. I don't think that's really him. He's really quite a laid back, more retiring kind of guy. So he's kind of pushing that persona out there. But he could win. But all of them are going to face this issue of how you unite this party. And every time they have a fight with each other, it kind of delays that process. Um, so I, I just can't. I, I think could, things could get unpredictable and, and really quite heated by the end of this. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. And, and Ashley, where do we go from here? When when can UCP members vote? When's the deadline to actually buy a membership? And and do we get to see these candidates square off again? So there's there's a lot of, broadly speaking, there's a lot of places this could go. I wanted to just point out that uh, for Jason Kenney's leadership review, the party had 60,000-ish uh, members on the list. If you add to that... Presumably, all the candidates are also um, currently trying to sell memberships. There are a, there's a lot of ways that this could go, especially with the ranked ballot as it is. Um, mm-hmm. So there's still a whole bunch of ways that this could shake out. But more specifically, the cutoff date, if you want to buy a membership to vote, is August 12th. So that is coming up. Um, and then about two weeks after that, at the end of August... Um, the candidates will be doing this again, uh, this time in Edmonton. The big question yeah. is how many memberships have been sold. And, and Leela here mentioned last night a kind of key number. I understand that the candidates are not allowed to say how many members the party has. And the list that they get when they clear the, uh, the hurdle for funneling money to the party and making those payments, uh, they started out somewhere around 62, and Leela let slip last night that they're about 72,000 now. Uh, that's hmm. not that much. If, if that's the case, they haven't really sold all that many memberships. Um, so I'm not sure if those figures are accurate or if hers was accurate. But if um, if they haven't indeed sold a lot of memberships, maybe that would suggest very strongly this Smith's campaign isn't as strong as it, it looks. I don't think it's as strong as it looks, but I think it is strong. I think it's strong enough to win. But nonetheless, I would not rule out either Taves or Gene. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I did want to ask about, you know, 
Don, in the in the aftermath of the debate, the fir- the first thing that I saw was Daniel Smith's campaign out with a you know a message that you know all of these people are going after me, and I'm the only one focused on going after Rachel Notley and Justin Trudeau. Do you think that the strategy of of some of the candidates focusing on Smith more than some of their other opponents plays into Smith's hands and, and gives her that boost or at least allows her that campaign messaging to say, like, I'm the only one who's going to, who's above the fray. Everyone else is nipping in my heels. Um, look at me, how I look, how strong I am. Well, once again, people in the party have to decide whether they want to take out their frustrations on a, a absentee prime minister or they want to think about who's going to win the election. And the other ones yeah. all say with some credibility, this is just a, a little bridge too far. There's so many people in the province who are really, really angry and have some good cause to be. But there are also the people who are very, very noisy and whose opinions are very obvious on social media. And, and I don't think the thing is we don't quite know how this the so-called center of that party feels, how many people are joining up because they want to vote against Daniel Smith because of that idea. Um, it, I don't think I've ever seen a situation in all the years I've covered these kinds of things where you just can't quite grasp where the where it might end up, how far that kind of thing is going to push uh, toward the end of the contest and that, whether that might get her elected. And then, of course, the big question is, does she get the UCP elected next time around? You don't hear a lot of people in the party saying, well, you know, I want to think carefully about how to win. All the, all the other ones were saying that to Danielle last night. You can't win with this. Or most of them were. Um, but I suspect that, yeah, there are, as Jason Kenney liked to say, a lot of more moderate people in the party, and they uh, maybe they prevail at the end of the day. By the way, uh, we kind of have to admit that Kenny seems to have been right about a couple of things. He he pushed hard against extremists in the party, and uh, and yeah. he made a lot of people who weren't extremists in the party think he was insulting them. But in, in some ways, he was right about what the potential is for extremism taking over that party. Well, I know I know that there's a, a lot of ways that this could go over the next few weeks, and it's something that we'll be covering closely uh, here at Under the Dome. Also, CalgaryHerald.com, EdmontonJournal.com, Don Braid, Ashley Joano, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. That's it for another episode of Under the Dome. Don't forget you can find all past episodes at EdmontonJournal.com slash Under the Dome, or you can hit that subscribe button on YouTube. I'm Dave Breckenridge. We'll see you next time.